Resurrecting hope. What a great theme for Easter Sunday and actually in the next four weekends as we come together in worship in this new sermon series called Resurrecting Hope. You know, Easter, it's a wonderful day, is it not? We, this side of the empty tomb, get to wake up with great anticipation. But have you ever thought about the fact that before that on that first Easter Sunday, before Easter became the celebration of new life, that first morning when the light dawned, it was a time of grief and of mourning for Jesus' death. It had only been a few days before that the disciples had watched their friend and their savior and master, the one they believed to be the long-awaited Messiah, be crucified on a cruel Roman cross. They had placed all of their hopes and dreams in the coming kingdom that Jesus said he was going to bring into the world. But on that Friday before that first Easter, his disciples were crushed when they saw Jesus' body brought down from the cross and laid inside a grave. It was the finality of Jesus' death that would have been the knockout blow to any hope that the disciples had for a world where where God would finally rule and reign, when he would free them from the sin that had corrupted everything. And so their hopes were dashed, unrealized certainly, and in desperate need of being resurrected. Unrealized hope. It comes not just then, but even today. Unrealized hope for you actually may be one of the the biggest pains, painful things that you're carrying around with you, even this morning. Sometimes disappointment, it, it comes in all kinds of things, some that are rather insignificant, some that are life altering. Here's just a few pictures on screen of different kind of ways that disappointment can be experienced. We're looking to give someone a tip and you pull out your wallet and there's no cash. Whoops, disappointing, a little embarrassing. Or maybe this next image is, you've experienced this at your own laptop or computer and that browser is just not working the way you want it to. And then, Minnesota Vikings fan that I am. (laughs) We're known for the games we've lost, not the ones we've won, including last, the last throw short of the first down. But you know, these are really very insignificant. Who among us can ever forget the hopes dashed on September 11th, 2001? Lives crushed, hopes ruined. And most of us have stood by the side of a grave of someone that was very dear to us. And we know what it's like to see a loved one placed in a tomb, in a grave, and how that can crush our hopes and dreams. Every one of these pictures comes with uh, all kinds of different emotions. And if you've ever found yourself, especially in these significant times of hopes being dashed, perhaps you can relate very well to the followers of Jesus, what they felt on that first Easter morning. After three days of deep sorrow, they were in desperate need of resurrected hope. And if we're honest this morning, some of us came here today in need of renewed hope as well. You can come in with a face that doesn't show it, but just below the surface, You're in desperate need. Things feel hopeless. Life's not been easy. Some of us have faced great challenges already this year. Perhaps you've had a devastating loss of some kind. Maybe your closest relationships have suffered recently. Some have had to come to terms with a diagnosis that makes your future uncertain. These things and more, they can be so heavy 
Such a burden that it can make us question sometimes, even if, does God still care? Is he still even at work in my life, in the world? But all four Gospels in the New Testament tell us that right in the middle of the disciples' darkest hour comes the inbreaking light of hope of Jesus Christ. And here's my first point. That hope appears when we least expect it, but need it most. Early in the morning on that third day after Jesus' death, a woman named Mary Magdalene made her way to Jesus' tomb. Other places in Scripture tell us that she had come to anoint his body for burial. When she arrives, she finds not only the stone rolled away, the tomb is open, but it's empty. Adding insult to injury, the body is missing. And Mary concludes that someone must have come and taken away her beloved Jesus. She's devastated. So I want to pick up the account here from John chapter 20 reading from verse 11, and then we'll come back into this a little bit more in the message. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you've sent the greatest gift we could ever receive, your son. Sometimes we don't see him. Holy Spirit, open up our hearts and our eyes to see the resurrected, risen Christ. And that in you, Lord Jesus, our hope would be renewed and resurrected this day. I ask in your precious name. Amen. Dear friends, on this Easter morning, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, I want to frame the sermon message around three images, or three pictures, if you will. One is a negative picture, the second is a positive picture, and the third is the big picture. So the first snapshot, a negative picture. Scanning uh, the congregation here, I know many of you, do you remember times in photography when a camera had actual film in it, right? You remember that? Before digital photography? And you take a picture, and it'd be a while before you knew if it was going to be a good shot or not, because you had to have that film developed, and that film was actually a a negative of the image, where light appears dark, and dark appears light. And that's kind of what comes to my mind when I think, what was Mary, how was she seeing her world? It's like a, a negative image. As Mary looks into the tomb where Jesus had been laid, All she can see is what's missing. She fails to see what is there. Even that which is light is dark for her. She's so focused on the fact that Jesus' body is gone that she misses the two angels seated where he'd been laid. She saw them, but she didn't recognize them as angels. She just thought they were men. Through her tears, she tells the angels that she's heartbroken. Because not only is Jesus dead, but now his body's disappeared. And this can happen to you when you lose hope. Can you relate with Mary seeing the world in the negative? When your dreams are shattered, your future becomes unclear. It can become all too easy to fixate on what has not happened or what you don't have or what others didn't do or what is missing. And after Mary speaks to the angels, she she turns to leave and comes face to face with the resurrected Jesus. But as our text said in verse 14, she did not realize that it was Jesus. Again, light is dark. Resurrection hope was standing right in front of her. 
And yet she was unable to see it because her world had gone dark. After all, Mary had not come to the tomb expecting to see Jesus alive. She came expecting to find his lifeless body. And as we're reading just a little bit, though, all it takes is for Jesus to say one word. One word, and the fog of despair is lifted for Mary. Jesus says her name, Mary. And when Jesus speaks her name, Mary's world is completely changed. When Mary encounters the risen Christ Jesus, her negative picture of her world all of a sudden is turned resplendent technicolor, full of wonder and beauty and promise. Her world is now remade, new, full of hope. And what it takes for Mary to recognize the presence of Jesus is for her to hear Jesus speak her name. And dear friend, might that be you this day? For some of you, you woke up this morning, your world was dark, full of fear or worry. Perhaps a, a disappointment lingers. You wake up and like, oh yeah, that, that did happen. Mm, ouch. Or your heart is crushed by a tragic loss. If so, may I encourage you to, to look up to look up to God in prayer, in hope, expecting to see him, hoping to see him. Yes, pour out your thoughts and your feelings to God and then wait for his answer. And maybe, just, just maybe, you might hear him whisper your name, letting you know that he's there, that he cares, that he's listening and loves you. And when your expectations are set that way, your negative picture can be turned into the second snapshot, a positive picture. The level of expectation, are you looking to find Jesus? You know, I'm not going to get into the origin of Easter eggs or Easter bunnies, but there's in some ways nothing that brings a smile to my face more than watching a family on an Easter egg hunt. You know, watching my kids when they were young hunting Easter eggs. It's one of my favorite memories of raising my young family. I remember when my daughter was less than two years old and just, you know, the, the sounds of joy on her face when, in her voice when she'd find an Easter egg hunt. Here she is. Her joy was contagious. <laughs> I can still get goosebumps just remembering it now, decades later. Now I bear the image of one for whom it's the grandchildren that carry on the search, keep the search going, and what fun. Because children, no matter the age, they love to search for hidden Easter eggs. And why? I think it's because they love the surprise by the location where the, the eggs are found. They squeal with joy on each discovery because the eggs are always found when they least expect it but they're always hopeful. They search with an expectation that somewhere, maybe just around that next corner, there has to be an egg there, and they never give up the hope that they will find the next egg. And herein, perhaps, lies the key to keeping hope alive, is to keep your eyes open, remain in search mode, and have high levels of expectation. Even when your hopes are down, the Bible says in Psalm 94, verse 19, Lord, when doubts fill my mind, when my heart is in turmoil, quiet me and give me renewed hope and cheer. Perhaps that's a prayer some of you need to pray today before the Lord. If you've lost hope in your life, perhaps it might be in part because you've stopped searching for it. So Easter is this gentle reminder that God is in the business of awakening hope within us. And he, he can do this in different ways. It can be subtle and can be missed if we're not mindful. Maybe hope comes through a simple conversation with a friend you haven't seen for a long time. Maybe hope is spoke, sparked by a small answered prayer. This happened to a couple of friends of mine just yesterday they talked to me before the service began. 
One had just seen friends they haven't seen for a long time. It was a joyous reunion. Another received a phone call from a grandson they'd been praying for. He said, Grandma, you know what? I think it's time for me and my family to go back to church. Resurrected hope. Hope can be found in an unexpected text or a letter in the mail. It could come by noticing the beauty of a sunrise or being smitten with the smile of a child. Hope can be found in taking time to be grateful for what we do have rather than remain on the frustration of what we don't have. And so the key really is your expectation level. Just like a child searching for eggs in the yard, we can search the horizon for God's signs of his presence. And in that finding, our hope is renewed. For you see, and here's the second point, Easter comes at just the right time. It's really Jesus' compassion for those he loves that caused him to sacrificially give up his life. And it is his compassion also that causes him to resurrect from the dead. And as he meets Mary in the doorway of his now empty tomb, Jesus' immediate concern were actually the tears streaming down Mary's face. As we continue in our text, Jesus asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Just as Mary had given up all hope, she meets the resurrected Jesus who meets her in her tears and says, Mary, why are you crying? John, the author of this book, tells us that Mary thinks Jesus is the gardener tending the grounds around the tombs. And I think John offers this information on purpose. And not just because Mary's confused or mistaken, though she is, but in another way she's actually correct because Jesus is tending to the broken places of life. He is, in fact, remaking the brokenness that began in a garden long ago, recorded in the book of Genesis. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that in the beginning, God created a garden of perfection for his creation to reside in and enjoy. And he had a perfect relationship with them, and they experienced life to its full. But the man and woman God had created disobeyed him. Ate fruit from a tree they were forbidden to eat. And instantly, sin and death were introduced to the world. And everything was broken. In Genesis 3 we read, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called out to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Isn't that something? God came searching for his creation in the garden he'd made for them, but they knew they were naked, so they hid. And my friends, I think the story of Easter is about God who re-enters a garden to search for those he loves and to offer life to them once again. And as soon as Jesus says Mary's name, she recognizes him, calls him teacher. And in the middle of her darkest moment, Easter came just in time. This is the positive picture that all of us now get to live in, that Jesus Christ is risen. Let me say it and you respond. Christ is risen. He is. And in this resurrection, it leads, it changes our negative picture to a positive and then leads us to the third snapshot, which is the big picture. Easter reminds us that there's a bigger piece to all of this. 
You know, with the season of Easter comes this long-awaited birth of spring, right? You know what I mean? I mean, in some places around the country, typically up north, you know, I know many of you, you're following it on your apps or on the phone with the family or on TV. Winters can be harsh and bitter, can't they? And sure, it can be fun to have that first snow. It's beautiful on the tree branches and maybe you like to, you know, square off and, you know, snow blow that driveway once. <laughs> have a snowball fight or build a snowman. And I'm kind of actually okay with winter and cold, kind of, you know, through Christmas and up till right about January 2nd, and then I'm kind of done. I'm ready for it to be all gone, but that's not the deal, is it? And after weeks and months of cold weather, winter grows old. Trees without leaves, ground covered in ice and snow, wind that can freeze the skin off your face. It can cause people to count down the days until things begin to warm up and everything comes back to life. And I know some of you are counting those days down right now. And yet even so, on that day when winter turns to spring, when it comes, it seems a bit unexpected. Because we, we grow so accustomed to a world without life that we are shocked when we finally see the first signs of life bud out on the trees or a piece of grass begin to turn green. But spring always comes to bring life to a barren land. From death comes life. It's Martin Luther who once said, our Lord has written the promise of resurrection not in the books alone, but in every leaf in springtime. And so the seasons of life remind us that God does indeed bring life from death. He can bring life to our most hopeless of places. And it may seem that God is not always active or that he's last minute, but you know what? He's never late. He's always on time, on his time. And for Mary, you can feel her story shift as she recognizes that Jesus is alive. Her hope is resurrected. Her negative picture becomes positive. But then it moves to the larger picture. The dream of restoration and healing in her life is once again possible. And I wonder what would happen today if you were able to see Jesus all around active in your life. Maybe especially in the places you think he's been missing. So let this Easter be a time when you look at Jesus square in the face and hear him call you by name and to know that hope can be resurrected in your life because Jesus is alive. My third and final point, here's the big picture. The resurrection is victory over death. You see, what Mary discovered early at the tomb was that the thing she believed to be the most final was not the end, but rather only the beginning. Jesus rising from the dead meant that sin and its ultimate outcome, which is death, could not overcome Jesus Christ. Jesus held power and sway over it. Death did not have the final say. Jesus did. And the powerful revelation that comes from this truth is that if Jesus can overcome death, there is nothing in your life that he cannot defeat or overcome. Earlier in the book of John, Jesus makes this audacious claim when he he says these words to a friend of his whose brother had just died. He said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And then the Bible continues, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Eight years ago, my best friend, Norm, died. And I was asked to go out, he was up in New England, and asked to go out to preside over his funeral. I'd known he and his family, and they were dear friends. And as I'm standing by the casket with his family, Norm's dead body in the casket, we are about ready to close it. I was about to pray with the family. I just quietly myself intentionally placed my hand on Norm's cold, hard shoulder. And I wanted to do this because I wanted to be intentional about remembering that time 
and believing in the hope of resurrection that one day I would see my friend again in flesh and blood in his resurrected and glorified body and be able to hug him, living into the promise of resurrection that Jesus has given to all who trust in him. Jesus said to his followers then, and he says it to us today, that he is the resurrection and the life. He is the hope of life eternal and the, the key to true life now. And this is not just our uh, uh, intellectual exercise. It's our belief. It's a deep trust that we have in Christ Jesus that ensures that the worst things that may happen to us in life will not be the last things that happen to us. We have a hope that is resurrecting all around us for a full life in Jesus now and everlasting to come. And so on this Easter morning, I invite you, believe in the resurrected Christ. See him. Listen for his voice. I want you to receive the new birth and renewed hope found in Jesus alone and allow him to create new life in you and in the world around you. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for the hope that all of us can find in Easter. The account of your resurrected life renews our spirits and you invite us to believe in you with all that we are. So I ask that by your Holy Spirit, no one here today would miss you, to miss seeing you, to see you in your fullness and to place their trust in your grace for their heart, their life now, and their life to come. Lord God, we give you all the, the dead places within ourselves, all of the hopeless thoughts in our minds and hearts, all of our feeble prayers. We look with anticipation and hope and gratitude for your work in each of our lives. May we see you, the resurrected Christ, this day and for the rest of our lives, each one. I ask Jesus in your precious name.